welcome everyone to um, today's talk uh, within the Design++ Plus Plus, uh, speaker series. And it's my uh, special pleasure to welcome Professor uh, Wortmann, uh, who is uh, giving a talk today. And uh, yeah, as you know, the Design++ Plus Plus speaker series is a recurring event. Uh, we host all these talks on our YouTube uh, channel. We have a homepage. Feel free to browse through the past uh, lectures which have been uh, exciting and in case you want to get into touch uh, either write to Daniele or me and uh, we will reach out to you. Having said that uh, as uh, already introduced uh, it's uh, our special pleasure to host Professor Wattmann today from the University of Stuttgart and he will uh, deliver us a talk on uh, AEC for AI for AEC <laughs> And uh, yeah, please allow me to give some background. Uh, professor Wattmann is a tenure track professor who directs the chair of computation in architecture at the Institute of Computational Design and Construction, ICD, at the University of Stuttgart. He is also a full faculty member at the International Max Planck Research School for Intelligent Systems. He holds a master in architectural design from the University of Kassel, a master of science in design and computation from the MIT and a PhD in architecture and sustainable design from Singapore University of Technology and Design. Before uh, joining Stuttgart, Thomas taught uh, at National University of Singapore and held a position uh, at the university in Susu in China. He researches and teaches the application of AI methods uh, and visualization in architectural design and construction and uh, leads the development of the Opossum toolbox, which you may know uh, from Rhino Grasshopper. And uh, yeah, with that information, which you can also find on our YouTube homepage, I would hand over and uh, just switch the microphone. So, hello everybody, I hope you can see my presentation. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the nice introduction and the literal handover. Um, the plan for today is I'm gonna present uh, some of the research work that I've been doing and my group has been doing in the past couple of years. Uh, some of it is also with Christoph Weibel, who is, is here, yeah, a special pleasure. And since we are kind of among friends, um, please feel free to interrupt me, um, which will be easier for the, the audience that is actually here with the online audience. Um, maybe I will notice it, maybe not. Otherwise, uh, we, we can discuss after the lecture. So uh, with that, welcome. Um, I want to talk about uh, this AI for AC, which has become kind of my slogan. And I have subtitles, data, information, knowledge, just to, to give a little bit of a structure to what I want to talk about. So, and what I want to talk about, okay, yeah. So we're gonna talk a little bit about data analytics. We're gonna talk about sorry, models. We're gonna talk about single objective optimization. We're gonna talk about multi-objective optimization. We're gonna talk about something I call performance-informed design. And finally, we're gonna talk about knowledge graphs. And as you can maybe see, this spans a whole gamut from where do we get our data? What do we do with the data? Can we learn from the data? And then finally, maybe we can also use some symbolic AI methods like knowledge graphs and so on. Uh, this is kind of the area that I'm covering with my group in any kind of um, computer science and specifically AI methods broadly understood uh, to support the design of the built environment. And so uh, this talk, we're going to proceed from the data to information to knowledge. Uh, and knowledge, uh, not as in human knowledge, but in uh, machine knowledge. Okay, so um, starting with the data analytics and not just any data analytics, but learning from and for digital fabrication. So that is kind of uh, the clearest intersection of uh, what I do uh, with the work of uh, Achim Menges, who is the, the Institute Director, of course, at the ICD. And so uh, what my PhD uh, researcher, Leo Skuri has done here, he's developed a kind of management platform that manages 
our digital fabrication. So it uh, takes in a list of tasks that could be assigned uh, to humans or also to different kinds of robots. And it's distributing the tasks. So on the one hand, it's it's kind of just a management is a management system. It, it but it's also orchestrating uh, the cooperation between the humans and the robots. Although I have to say it's not um, it's not a very democratic. Uh, kind of cooperation because basically the system will tell the humans what to do so that they can work properly with the, ro the robots. Um, but because we have the system, we also can collect a lot of data about the fabrication process, which is very interesting. And so uh, then there is a kind of interface that, that manages these kind of tasks and how they're distributed to the humans. And so for a recent project, we have then uh, tracked all of the fabrication steps. So we know exactly how many steps uh, were taken for each of the production steps. And we also know uh, what was done, right? So there was some gluing, there was uh, pick and place, uh, there was the changing the tool, and it's all of these kind of things that happen in a typical robotic fabrication process. And we also know how long that takes. And of course, uh, we know that the, the humans take up much more time than the robots. And then we can look, how does this uh, progress in the sense if we have uh, components that need more steps, do they also take longer? And so you can see there is a roughly uh, linear trend here. But there's something very uh, complicated going on here once uh, a certain complexity is reached. So there is kind of a, a let's say, a, a special bit in, in this area where the, the complexity of the components is such that, that we lose this kind of roughly linear relationship between the number of steps that are necessary and the time it takes. Uh, but if we, if, we, if we zoom in on this, then we can see that this kind of flat trend. So basically what we can already learn from this is uh, once you have reached a certain uh, complexity of component that we want to build, um, but they all more or less uh, roughly take the same time. And so um, this is in relationship to one of the, the, the uh, timber shells of the ICD that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, right. And so the latest step, which is something that Leo uh, started on just now, is then of course we want to learn from this data. So it can be used as a predictive model. So here you can see the, the actual data plotted versus uh, the predictions that we that we uh, are doing with a neural net. And so the point is then if we have a future fabrication process, we, we can basically try to predict how long this will take uh, the individual components, therefore allowing us to make the process more efficient. And so this is um, a fairly recent, uh, yeah, so, so this is like we have gathered this data in the past six months. And so what we're also now doing is um, we're collecting data about these components that we've produced also on the construction side. So we are, we are, we're measuring also the assembly and also the construction is also a little bit roboticized. So basically we're trying to establish this complete data chain of the fabrication and assembly of the project. Uh, with the goal of learning from that for, for future and larger projects. Which, and so what I'm showing you here, that is already um, a kind of surrogate model, right? It's a surrogate model of a fabrication process, which leads me into my next topic of surrogate models. That one is, is um, more related to, to the, the work I did during my PhD, which is not so much fabrication, but more uh, building simulation related. And so I was, uh, like to show this first, like why do we do building simulation? So this is some data about real buildings from the American Institute of Architects, where they show just the fact that uh, the energy consumption of a building has been simulated versus as has been not simulated leads to about 10% energy reduction. And so this says nothing about whether any good decisions have been made to, to make the building more efficient. This shows that you simulate a building, uh, building's performance means you think about it, and that automatically uh, will make it better. And so very early on in my PhD, I wrote this paper about what are surrogate models good for. Just very quickly, of course, they're faster, right? So fast is good because we can have real-time feedback. We can optimize faster and therefore we can explore solution spaces more interactively. And then we can refine them by refining our models. And we can also change our objectives by sort of doing a, a re-weighting of the weighted sum that we get from our surrogates. And I'm just showing a, a very practical recent example of what this means um, by my PhD researcher, Max. So what we're doing here, that's not so exciting, right? So we have an energy model, and then of course we have a simulation model that we simulate the heating and the cooling, takes about a minute to run. And then we have a surrogate, which takes 56 milliseconds, is fairly accurate. So that's 
that is not so spectacular. Uh, but I think what's interesting is that we then integrated this in a dashboard that we did together with Gruner engineers. So it, here you then get all manner of different performance characteristics related to the embodied energy, the energy consumption. You also get the, the financial considerations, how much rentable floor space do I have? Um, how much money can I make uh, from this massing? And so this becomes now a decision-making tool that, that can be used with a, a group of, of stakeholders. And um, yeah, so basically I think that, and that, that is something I see now as a really practical trend that we see these, these dashboards in multidisciplinary design that, that are enabled by these kinds of surrogate models. And in fact, Max won the best paper award for this application, I would say, of surrogate models at BAUSIM. Uh, then this is uh, something I actually did together with Chris and a, a student um, that I, I, well, we have a relationship dating back to my time in China, Ran Zhang, who is now a PhD student at uh, South, uh, South China University. So, and both uh, Chris and me are kind of still, uh, supervising him. So, and this was a, a, a conference paper about trying to predict uh, CFD simulation results um, by using, um, the, the fast fluid dynamic results that result from a plugin that uh, Chris has written to predict the CFD, which would take longer to simulate. So that, that I think was a really good idea, uh, but it didn't work very well. So um, you can see here that there are some CFD results and especially interesting here are the absolute numbers, very high pressures. And then you can see the FFD results, which look similar, but very different pressures. So that could still be okay if I want to predict the FFD from this, if I want to predict the CFD from the FFD, uh, but unfortunately the two are really not very correlated at all. Um, and so we found out after that, that the reason for that are essentially the boundary conditions of these simulations. And so um, important public service announcement, if, if you want to do CFD simulations, especially in Grasshopper, um, the, the preset boundary conditions that you get are widely different and you will get widely different results if you just accept the defaults. And so that is something that uh, Ranjak has been working on in the in the last year, just trying to find out okay, how do how do we actually get different tools to line up so that they give us uh, similar results and results that also line up with known wind tunnel data. And once that work is done, then we will get back to our original goal, which was trying to predict the CFD results. Uh, different work, but also in this world of uh, surrogate models by my PhD researcher Zoadin. Uh, where we're trying to predict our material behavior. So you might be familiar with the line of research at ICD about self-shaping wood. So you use the, the moisture changes to, to uh, induce a curvature. So for example, this can be done uh, to, to do like self-assembling furniture um, or also of course, um, sort of in curved timber architecture. And a big challenge in this is uh, predicting the shape that the wood will take logically. Uh, you can do a finite element approach, of course, and there are very sophisticated uh, finite element models in order to predict this curvature. Um, but there is a certain limit in terms of what the finite element method can achieve due to the natural variations in the wood. And so we thought, okay, this might also be a good machine learning problem. And so we did a, a prototype basically where we we don't do any final element analysis. Instead, we just gather data from samples and then we try to predict the curvature. Uh, this worked very well. So what you see here at the top, this is not really a finite element, but a very simplified model that is being used within the ICD to sort of um, guess what the shape would probably be. And below here, you can see the actual data and the predictions of the model. And so, so you can see this, I mean, maybe we, we don't, care too much, maybe these are very small differences in the end, but it, it's clear that the, the model is quite far away from the actual data. And so what we're doing here now is uh, we, we try to uh, integrate, similar with uh, FFD, CFD research. So we, on the one hand, we, 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 we are gathering more uh, material samples, but of course this is a tedious, expensive process. So on the other hand, uh, we want to integrate this approach with finite elements so that we get kind of the, the best of both worlds. So I get generalized uh, predictions from the finite element model, but I can still uh, integrate that uh, with data from the material samples because um, the material, there's a certain quality to the material that have changed the results. And so for, for example, in this case, 
uh, the most important thing is, is like the layout of the wood fibers, which we then capture just with this, this photographs and, and do some image processing to, to get some characteristics about this fiber distribution. And that's what's allowing us to get this um, tight match. Okay, so but these are so a lot of broad applications, I think, of this um, surrogate modeling strategy, machine learning strategy, learning from data. And uh, what I did um, already a couple of years ago in my PhD is, is combine this type of approach with optimization. And so I'm gonna talk also a little bit about optimization. And so why do we talk about optimization? Well, because we all do parametric design nowadays and we always have performance criteria nowadays. I think basically, especially life cycle and, and carbon should be our performance criteria. And so that's clearly an optimization problem. And so the, the, the way I talk about this, I was talking about the design space. So that is the, the parametric space where all my design possibilities live. And that is also the kind of thing that you explore with these dashboards. And then there is the fitness landscape where I can label every design this a certain performance. But uh, if it's a single objective uh, optimization, then there's maybe only one performance criterion, which is probably not enough, right? So we just saw in this dashboard, there are actually many performance criteria. And then the surrogate model is the approximation of that fitness landscape. And then as a different paradigm, and that's uh, kind of important that if you do multi-objective, uh, show here at the bottom, then you're, we're talking about the different space now. So we're talking about what I call the trade-off or the objective space. So now the designs are located according in a high dimension space, just according to the performance. And so where they are located in the objective space might not have any relationship to where they are located in the design space. Okay, so, and then uh, I'm not sure this, I don't want to go too too strong on this, but this is, you can read this a lot in the literature. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm, I've been trying uh, to change the minds on this. I'm not sure how successful I've been, but uh, basically this is just not correct. Um, if we mean that evolutionary organs are robust in the sense that we give you the same result, uh, once you repeat an optimization, that is not true. And if you mean that they reliably give you a good convergence, that is also not true. Um, so here are just some diagrammatic um, uh, illustration of what I'm talking about. Right? So we have a fitness landscape. The fitness landscape has three global minima. The game is you need to find one of those global minima as quickly as you can. The more black dots you see, that means the more steps the algorithm took to achieve this goal. We can see different algorithms here. And what you can see is, first of all, there's different amounts of black. So there's different, there's a different efficiency in the search and there's also really different strategies, right? And so you can see how the, the, the different strategies result in a different picture, right? And so the genetic algorithm yeah. is still, is still, oops, sorry, still ongoing, right? And it's just kind of quasi random, doesn't, it's very hard to actually see a logic in there, except that there's a sort of densification around this point, right? And by the simulated annealing, that has this, this property that, that it, it does these kind of linear type searches. There's a particle swarm here where yeah, you can see the particle swarm, I think, uh, direct something completely different. So direct says for dividing rectangle. So this is a subdivision approach where it will always divide the space and it will, it will subdivide where it thinks that the optimum might be. And then it's do sort of a branch and bound. So you subdivide, subdivide, then you find, oh, but now I'm actually worse than where I was. So then you go back up the tree and you start subdividing. That's a really nice approach if you don't have too many variables. Uh, but typically we tend to have a lot of variables in my experience. So, so then that doesn't work so well. And then the final one, that is the, the algorithm that uh, opossum is most, is more, most known for, RBFOP, the radial basis function optimization. And so now we get the link back to the surrogate modeling. So basically the radio basis function, that is a kind of surrogate model of the fitness landscape. And uh, the point of the algorithm is that you optimize both on the actual problem and also on the surrogate model. And on the surrogate model, you are approximate, but you can do a lot of steps very quickly. On the actual function, you get the actual result, assuming of course that the simulation is accurate, but it takes longer and, but you can switch between the two and that is what makes it efficient. And so the big picture is there are these meta heuristics, which is all the, the genetics, uh, the particle swarms or the bio inspired things. Then the di direct search, for example, the di dividing rectangle. And then this last um, category is this model based where I'm, I'm optimizing somehow with a, a surrogate. And the, the key here is that as I go along, I optimize and I prove uh, and improve my surrogate. So I try to 
as in the process, I try to fit my circuit better to the fitness landscape. And I'm also trying to find the minima in the landscape at the same time. So that is to be distinguished from other types. So of course you can, this is like the normal case. This is the, the standard case you optimize just without a circuit. Then you can of course also optimize the circuit so that you can see quite a bit, right? So, so I, I simulate uh, 2000 samples, then I build a surrogate, and then I run optimization on the surrogate to find the optimal result. Uh, the problem with that is that the optimum in the surrogate might not actually be the optimum in the landscape. And that totally depends on the sampling. And so that's why, why model-based actually does this kind of switching back and forth. So you get a small number of samples, you build the model, you optimize the model, then you evaluate the, the actual function at the point where the model says optimum should be, then you can re rebuild the model. And so in time, you get better results, but you also get a uh, more accurate surrogate. And so I've tested this on, on a number of different problems, structural analysis, energy optimization, and daylight and glare optimization. And especially the, the daylight and glare optimization, uh, if you have some familiarity with it, annual glare is really takes a long time. So it's really slow. So you cannot do many steps. And that is where this kind of approach really shines. And so you can see in this comparison of different algorithms that RBF opt is the most efficient here. And then a typical genetic algorithm is the worst. If you're comparing two types here, the, Gal the, the Galapagos genetic algorithm and Grasshopper, and also just a standard uh, basic genetic algorithm. And then this is relative to 500 steps, right? So we're talking about a world where I don't want to do many steps either because I don't have a lot of time for example, in conceptual design, or I do something like annual glare or CFD, where even doing like 200 steps might take um, a day or two. Yeah, I have a question. So in the RBF, is there gradients taken? No. No. So I'm, I'm, uh, all of the algorithms I'm talking about are black box gradient-free algorithms. Mm -hmm. But really good question. And so the, the assumption here is that because we're in this world where we are, don't want to do many steps, um, we, we, it doesn't make sense to try to approximate the gradient. But for the RBF, they would be available. You could take, you could take, ah, yeah, but actually it's quite interesting. It's true, but it turns out empirically that the best way to optimize the RBF is a genetic algorithm. Mm -hmm. But then it's a genetic algorithm that has a very large population number and uh, also a very large step size, uh, which you can do because the surrogate is very fast. Um, yeah, so that's interesting, but then to my mind, the more interesting bit is actually uh, the so-called robustness, right? Because we've seen before that apparently the genetic algorithms are very robust. And so this is just repeating now the experiment and just running 20 times on the same problem. And so you can see that depending on the algorithm, we can get slightly different results. Like for example, here at the, at the extreme, right? The simple genetic algorithm, it's, it's, yeah, sometimes it works well. Maybe even most of the time it works well, but you can also, you might you might be super far away from the optimum to the point that that there was no point in optimizing at all, and so it's very important that you you get have this robustness where the results are close together, because the assumption is that as a designer as an engineer you're going to optimize once, right? You're not going to do this experiment where you run five ten times and then compare whether you have a spread here, and so. In this scenario, the, the RBF is the most reliable and then also the particle swarm, for example, is also fairly robust here. Then I did, in a sense, even more extensive study together with Chris, where we looked at 15 different uh, energy optimization problems. Um, as you can see, even more algorithms, more extensive data. Also, this is now according to simplex gradients, where like a simplex gradient is roughly the number of variables of the problem. So if the problem is very large, has a lot of variables, then you're also allowed to do more steps. And so what you can see here now that in the beginning, if you're, if you don't take many steps as before, is the best. If you allow the algorithms to take more steps, then other algorithms will, will become better. And so you can see there is a, is a whole family of diff actually different kinds of algorithms that do, do well. And here at the, at the very end, actually, even the simple genetic algorithm is, is basically the best. Um, but, and then actually let's go to, again, is the, the, the killing argument for me is uh, the robustness. And so basically all of these algorithms have a quasi random performance across what are all building energy optimization problems at the end of the day, even though they are, they're different in terms of the, the geometry of the buildings and the complexity and so on. But 
so, so it's very, if, if, you, if you pick any algorithm that is not CMA ears and RBF op, then you have almost no guarantee uh, that you will get anything meaningful. Uh, did you look into neural network architectures like other coolers and compare it to that for the optimization as a surrogate, as a learner tool surrogate? Mm, no. So, right, so I'm, I'm, I, this, I'm not sure. Then we would we still have to ask how we would uh, optimize, right? How do we search our encoded? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the idea is that you have a, a cheap surrogate which is produced by the neural network. And uh, what we, for example, use is that you can take analytical derivatives and use that analytically available gradients. And it basically comes down in a forward evaluation of this already given graph. So basically it comes down to the speed of the machine. Yeah. So I'm just, and yeah. So we did not check if it is robust so far. And what the building initially was. I'm just saying, yeah, it's really interesting if, like how this kind of surrogate models would look like. Because uh, maybe from the figure before, it is clear that the human complexity and for genetic algorithms to perform better because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, okay, so, but yeah, I would be interested in, in also um, comparing it to more network based surveys, which are tunable. Yeah, no, actually, uh, very interesting. Let's do it. Um, but I would, it depends, right? So, the, I'm not sure if you would. Come uh, succeed a lot with the gradient based search because also what we found in doing this that these these are all very multimodal, uh, very complicated landscapes where following the gradient typically does not lead to very good results. I think the benefit here is also that we don't have to construct the circuit in advance. Basically, just plug and play, and the circuit is being constructed on the fly. If I understand correctly, you have to construct the circuit in your case beforehand. I mean, you can initialize the surrogate, but you sample, I don't know, 20 buildings, or in this case, in a, or yeah, buildings with an energy uh, output. Then you would build the autoencoder, train it, and uh, you could resample and then train again. Right? So in the end, the model would also converge to some big. Yeah, and that's exactly so. That's exactly what Aviafop is doing. Um, but it's a good a good property of Aviafop. RBF op is that it's a simple model that can be recalculated very quickly because <clears throat> this, this whole approach of um, evaluating on the actual function and, and then also optimizing on the surrogate and then going back and forth, to my mind, only makes sense if you can uh, uh, train the model quickly. So that might be a disadvantage. If every time I, I go back and forth, I have to retrain my autoencoder, that's probably lead, uh, it will be slow in time, I assume. Yeah, and we, okay, we should that. <laughs> and so, and then the question is, what does this mean for multi-objective? So I have extended uh, RBF op into multiple dimensions. This is a very simple trick where um, I uh, basically we, uh, I build surrogate models for each objective separately, and then I can do different weighted sums over these surrogates, and then I can just um, do basically a series of single objectives optimization, uh, optimizations to approximate the Pareto front. Um, as my uh, co-advisor at the time, Giacomo Nanicini, a mathematician and computer science, is that uh, a surprisingly effective uh, approach for, um, for such a simple heuristic. Um, so we did, we did win the, the black box optimization uh, uh, um, Competition to objective expensive track in 2019 with this. Um, okay, there were only two other competitors, but Artilis is a company that sells optimization algorithms for a living. So it's if, if you can beat them, that is, is quite nice. Um, and so then I just have some more applications. So, so here we, we're looking at the sports hall, trying to optimize uh, the daylight and mean by minimizing uh, the, the energy consumption. This is a sports hall in Estonia. Surprisingly, also in Estonia, you get overheating. So it's, it's not so straightforward that if you if you make larger windows, yes, the, the electricity for the light goes down, but the electricity for the heat, uh, the cooling goes up. And so it's a, a kind of good multi-objective problem in that regard. That's a real contradiction between the different results. 
And so then we get a bunch of different Pareto fronts. And again, it's the same story that we then also look at the robustness where we can see most of the algorithms actually not very robust. And the, the RBF mob is quite robust, but also hype E um, invented at the ETH. Hyper volume estimation, that is one of the few uh, multi-objective algorithms that tends to be ro robust in my opinion, or uh, based on my results. And that's, uh, that is also one of the algorithms that are in Octopus. And then some more, some sh shaping some, some buildings according to urban optimization criteria in this again, similar prob similar results that yeah, the, the period fronts end up different. Although uh, similar, but it, it does make a difference, right? If you use this for to inform your decision making, it kind of makes a difference whether you how close you are to the correct Pareto front because you might arrive at different trade-offs. And similarly here, um, again, there is kind of this spread in robustness where in this case, RBF mod is not even that great and it's also not necessarily the best performing, but Hype, Hype E is doing quite well. So um, this is um, kind of a still ongoing topic for me. So I didn't get around to work a lot on this in the last uh, one or two years, but we are, we are boosting that research back up. So I think uh, there's still, uh, to, to my mind, the single objective uh, question, we ha there's uh, now I think a lot known, it's maybe not so interesting anymore, but in the multi-objective world, there is, um, yeah, there's a lot of assumptions and not enough benchmarking in my opinion. Uh, and then uh, quickly looking at performance informed design, the idea is, of course, at the end of the day, it's not only to find the optimal result, but it's about, as I said, it's about the information. How do we communicate something to the designer? And so we developed this thing called the Performance Explorer, where you get a, a visualization of the surrogate that was created in the optimization that you can uh, then interactively explore. So you can see the kinds of solutions that are well performing. You can also see which solutions are not well performing, for example, and use that to inform your decision making. Um, my PhD racer, researcher Max has been working on this for the past half year to kind of get out the worst bugs. So now if you get the newest version of a possible from Grasshopper, you also get this visualization plugin. Uh, but now the real question is how is for multiple objectives? Because this is only one, and there we are actively working with the Visualization Institute in Stuttgart to really uh, come up with a novel kind of visualization method that can cover both the design space and the trade-off space at the same time. Finally, I want to get to this topic of knowledge graphs. Uh, knowledge graphs is this kind of topic where e either you are familiar with it and, and you're a fan or you just never hear of it. So um, we are using it in a way that we say it's a kind of symbolic AI for BIM. Uh, knowledge graphs, you have all seen knowledge graphs. Like every time you, uh, you type a city into Google, uh, or, and it will tell you, oh yeah, Zurich is the capital of Switzerland. It's not, is it? Uh, it's, it's a city in, in Switzerland. It has some inhabitants. It's in this canton. It, it has these kinds of touristic sites. This information comes from a knowledge graph. And for example, also the whole of Wikipedia is modeled as a knowledge graph in the way of how concepts are related. And I think you had, I mean, some of, uh, I, I didn't get around to watch uh, Peter Powell's lecture, but I assume that was also all about knowledge graphs. Uh, and he was asking, can we design the semantics? And um, I think, yes, as, as we'll see. Uh, and so the, the motivation for this is com from, comes from this very uh, old paper, now 2005 from John Haymaker, where he, they compared uh, the goal in BIM, where we have this neutral IC format, that we can exchange information very freely from the comfort simulation to the 4D construction simulation, the lighting simulation, the life cycle. That's the goal. And then they, they studied the actual project and the actual project was like this. And I actually think that this is still the reality, right? That we have these kind of custom network workflows that maybe work for a specific project or for a specific practice but it's not this kind of generalized model, right? So I think there's something, basically, I think the, the approach on the left, the monolithic approach just inherently cannot work in my opinion. And so actually um, John Haymaker here agrees with me and says a single BIM will not adequately serve to communicate and control multidisciplinary interests present in a building project. So, um, and so then we did this analysis. And so primarily this is uh, my research at Yale that's working on this. Basically, okay, on one hand, I have distributed systems, right? That, that is, I would say, the reality of today. So distributed is I use something like Spectre or maybe I use Rhino inside Revit or all kinds of other different tools to connect my workflow together. 
uh, on geometry gym would be another example. Of course, then there is the the the, the church of building smart. Uh, we have one uh, data schema that should be shared by everybody. And then we say uh, maybe we can use this knowledge graph technology to be somewhere in the middle. To have this federated approach, we, we, we can agree on some kinds of shared concepts, but we don't have to agree on all of the shared concepts. Um, and so as a basis, we're using something called BOM. So BOM used to be the Bureau Hubbold object model. Now it's called the, now it is the building habitat object model. So it's an open source um, object model that on the one hand models the kinds of objects that Bureau Hubbold is engaged in. So engineering structures, civil structures, but then it also has a ton of uh, connections to simulation software, mostly structure simulation, but also some um, environmental simulations. Then it has different interfaces, Grasshopper, but also Excel, where, where Hapold has this very interesting policy that everybody in the office needs to be a sort of computational designer to the extent that even the, the old principles need at least to be able to manipulate an Excel sheet that will then influence the, the building design. And then there is the engine, and the engine are all the, the methods, right? Even something like um, calculating a center of gravity, that's like an engine method. So that's very interesting to us because one, so it's a, it's a practical approach to, to this kind of um, well integrative design that we want in the sense there is a lot of connections already to existing software, but more importantly, uh, there's a division between what the data is and what the operations are that we perform on the data. And that's very much aligned with the idea of knowledge graphs that we want to represent our concepts in the knowledge graph. And then we have algorithms that will work on those concepts. And so what we did, Together with Peter Hubbold, uh, we took this BOM and we mapped it into a uh, knowledge graph. So RDF, which you might or might not have heard of, uh, resource, resource description framework, that, that is like the, the language or the standard in which knowledge graphs are expressed. And so basically, we, yeah, so, so there's this mapping process that we take. And you could think this, uh, basically we take the, the knowledge of the Hapold engineers that they have encoded in the BOM data model and now map it into, into the knowledge graph. And that's uh, just the first step. And the, the result of that then is now an application in Grasshopper where you, one can do BIM and sort of create uh, models that have concepts like, like columns and walls and that have uh, uh, structural character um, and, and features and so on. And, we can convert it into a graph, we can visualize it, and then we can do uh, certain queries uh, on that graph. And I mean, th this is very much a prototype what I'm showing you. So um, right there, we're exporting the graph from Grasshopper and, and pushing it uh, to this like web interface that, uh, for to visualize and uh, query graphs. Because in the future, to me, a future BIM application, this should be integrated. So while you're designing, you're creating the graph and you can also and visualize and query the graph. But yeah, this is where we are right now. And then a result of this mapping process is that we already have now different namespaces, like the, the namespaces that are involved, they've kind of become ontologies. So we have an architecture ontology, a structure ontology, and an acoustic ontology, right? And that is really the difference with a standard BIM approach where you say, this has to be all one thing, where we say, no, it's much more coherent there is a certain architecture view on a building. There's a structural view on a building. There's maybe an acoustics view of the building. There's also a digital fabrication view on the building. And we accept that these care about different things and will want to rep uh, represent different concepts. But then the point is that because some concepts are shared, right? So for example, the concept of column is shared both in architecture and structure. We can tie that together with graphs. And so that is kind of, and what we're pursuing as a, an interoperability solution, right? So the, the thing I showed you at the beginning, this, uh, this uh, John Haymaker study, that is basically about the interoperability problem. Like how do I tie different kinds of software together to do multi multidisciplinary design? So we think uh, graphs are a solution for this or knowledge graphs are a solution for this. And then now going in the AI aspect is now is then the reasoning aspect, which is that, that we've been starting to explore recently. So for example, let's take some ICD project because we can represent the components as a graph as I've just showed you. And then you can do like a simple query, for example, just give me all the cassettes uh, that have a certain weight or something like this. And um, 
the, the, the beauty is that there are like um, specific languages like uh, Sparkle and Shekel that allow you to, to perform very complicated queries on this kind of data. So um, as I said, this is now a, a kind of simple query, but I think in the future, for example, it's, it should be at least conceptually very straightforward to, to do things like code checking to make sure or to do checks like do my doors have all the correct fire class and things like this. So by uh, by bringing BIM, by merging BIM with this knowledge graph world, we can apply a lot of algorithms and tools that have already been developed on the sort of data science side on, on other kinds of problems. And so this is kind of our current framework where we generate a graph from Rhino, then we can do our constraints and our rules using these kinds of languages uh, that I mentioned, like Shekel. Then we can do, do a change in the graph. So basically we can also design on the graph and not just on the geometry. And then we feed that back and this go, goes back into our architecture model. Um, the, the challenge is that it's actually very hard. Or if, if you try to represent 3D geometry in a graph like this, it will blow up the graph. And so that, that is now the actual research. Um, how do you bring this kind of approach, which works very well with concepts, works very well with semantics together with geometry, because as, as you probably all know, BIM at its core is the combination of geometry and semantics. And uh, you can, of course, just hang, right? You can just say, oh, here I have a node that is my geometry node. And below that, I have my geometric information. But that's not very satisfactory because we want to do reasoning, right? We want to draw conclusions also about the geometry. So this brings me to the, some conclusions or, or basically also some, some new questions because I, I think if you've seen, uh, apart for the, from the single objective, it's, it's, these are kind of all open topics that, that require uh, more research as always. So the, the first one I think is, is very promising and just an early start, right? So we showed we can somehow learn something from this uh, fabrication data, but what we really want, we want to much more directly, we want to acquire the data, learn from this and sort of feed that back in, into the design process to make better decisions about the fabrication. And then I think this dashboard stuff, as I said, this is basically already state of the art in the practice. And so there the question is much more, how can we have more generalizable sort of grads that will work across a, a wide range of uh, building volumes, like in the, in the current system that if you're this ruler, every project needs new surrogate models that are related to the site and the geometry. So that it would be nice uh, if we could somehow generalize across that. And indeed, uh, I'm hoping to have a new project uh, with uh, uh, Matthias Niepert, who is a machine learning expert at Uni Stuttgart, where we look at that topic. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, single objective rbf is a good jo choice when you do expensive evaluations, but multi-objective, we just need more benchmarking and we also need better algorithms. I think still do better, right? Because right now it's kind of changed. Sometimes HIV is good, sometimes RBF op, uh, MOP is good. Um, so it's not such a clear picture as in the single objective case. And that, that's kind of why I think we can do better in this area. Uh, I think the performance explorer, which I showed only quickly to you, allows us this kind of real-time performance informed design based on a surrogate. But what we really want, as I mentioned, is this kind of simultaneous visualization of the design space and the trade-off space, both in high dimensions. And then finally, just uh, since uh, Peter Pauls asked, can we design these knowledge graphs? I say, yes, we can. Uh, but we need this, what I call the semantic geometry representation. So we need to, to find a way to encode the geometry in, in a way that doesn't blow up the graph and that allows us to reason a uh, over it. And that, I think that that's what we'll be looking at in the next year. And with that, thank you very much.